So, hi, I'm Xuanyi, as uh, already mentioned, and I'm here to talk about efficient generic multidimensional slices. That's a mouthful. Now, um, multidimensional slices have been a pretty uh, topic of great interest in the Go community. And last year, Grisima actually gave a talk at .go uh, on how you can hack the Go compiler to, to, to prototype ideas. And he used multidimensional slices as an example. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about hacking the Go compiler. No, I want my library to work on box standard Go. Instead, what I'll be talking about is a story of three attempts at making these things work. Okay? And because multidimensional slices may not be a topic of much familiarity with a lot of people, I'm going to introduce um, the concepts and, and what is needed for a multidimensional slice. And yeah, so the first question um, we should ask is why? Why bother with multidimensional slices? And I struggled with this uh, for a bit. Uh, but I thought the best way was to, be, was to show you uh, why multidimensional slices were so important. So I'm going to switch over to this. Oh, dear. All right. So here I've got a Go program. It's pure 100%, 100% Go. And it takes English sentences, and it compiles them into a program. So we can try it out. What is um, 50 times what? 2? Cool. So here it shows every single step of the compilation from English into a logical form and then execution of the logical form. So the first step is a dependency parsing. And the dependency parser is powered by a neural network. And if you deal with neural networks, you would know that neural networks are powered by matrices and tensors. And then it goes into a stage for logical parsing. If you're familiar with uh, CKY style um, parsing, it basically does this. This is a CKY parse. And although it shows a matrix of um, numbers, it's actually a matrix of an interface type called cat spanner. Lastly, it converts it into a logical form, which is lambda calculus, if you will. And then it executes it and gives you the answer 100. So as you can see, multidimensional slices, or tensors as I know them, plays a very, very big role in everything. It powers almost everything that I do. So I hope that this has given you an insight as to why um, oh dear, um, multidimensional slices are important to me. And I hope you'll find it useful as well. What happened? So. Um, Let's go skip ahead and talk about um, multidimensional slices. A brief introduction. I've got a long, much longer one that I cut down about 100 slides for this. Uh, <laughs> it would be remiss to talk about multidimensional slices in Go if we do not talk about slice, uh, a Go slice. The, the, the genius of a Go slice is that every time you pass a slice around, you're passing a struct with three words, right? You, you pass around the, data, uh, the pointer and its metadata. And that's the genius. A slice in Go is a view on memory. Okay, we visualize, we can, we can visualize this as such. You got a pointer to a memory and a length and a cap. Now I'm going to skip uh, the rest of it and talk about math for a bit. Or oh, boring stuff really. Uh, so here we've got a vector. You can have a column or a row vector. And if you take these vectors and you stack them up one against each other, you've got a two-dimensional vector. You call them matrices. Here you've got an M by N matrix. And if you take these matrix matrices and you stack them layer by layer, you have a three-dimensional matrix or a three tensor. In this example, I have a two by m by n uh, tensor. Now the question is, how do you go about implementing these abstract mathematical concepts into a programming language? Um, a naive implementation, sorry, a naive implementation would look something like this. The problem is. The moment you start using this for active work, um, like deep learning stuff, you start finding that you run into pro uh, problems. Because it's, it's slow. It's really slow. Let's take the three tensor for an example. To get to your data, you need to jump from point A to the it's a slice of a slice. So you jump from the first slice to the second slice, and jump from the second slice to the third slice before you get to your data. Every time you want to access your data, you jump many slices. So the idea is to keep your data as close as possible together. So here is a better implementation of a, a matrix. You allocate it in under one flat slice, and you provide access um, methods, the index and coordinate methods. So when you want 0, 0, you, you'll, you'll get um, um, the index of 0 and returns the index of 0. And indeed, 
when you benchmark these things, you find that the slice of slice is about half as fast as the flat slab one. So now we've got a hint on how to build a multi-dimensional slice or a tensor, uh, fewer, smaller words. So we've got a hint on how to build a tensor that is relatively fast. But we need to realize that a multi-dimensional slice is a superset of a slice. So whatever a slice can do, um, our multi-dimensional slice, our tensor, has to be able to do the same thing. These are the operations that you can do on a slice. You can get a length, you can get a cap, you can slice a slice. By the way, worst name ever, a slice. It's not a noun. Uh, and um, you can access the slice, you can append slices, but I'm not going to go through all this, I'm going to go through a few of them that are the key concepts. So we have a shape. For a, a slice, you've got a length. You, if, if a slice is a length of five, you understand that there are five elements in it. A shape is equivalent to a, a length, but you've got many dimensions of it. So if in a, in a two-dimensional matrix, for example, you've got a three-five matrix, meaning you've got three rows, five columns. That means within your row dimension, you've got a length of three, and within your columns dimension, you've got a length of five. The next thing we need to talk about is access. Oops. Sorry, just keep forgetting that keyboards don't work. So um, in a flat slice, in a, in a normal slice, access of data is very simple. The com com compil compiler handles all it, all, all the rest of the information. So all you need to do from, to go to the next index is plus one. So the next index from zero is one. But when you come to multidimensional slices, again, um, matrices, for example, you've got now two indexes. And we call this a coordinate. You've got zero, zero, and one, zero. But remember, your matrix is implemented as a flat slice. So what is 1, 0 here? 1, 0 is S5. And what is 1, 1? S6. 0, 1 is S1. So by here, here we, can, we can understand that in order to go from one row to the next, you jump 5. Why five? Because there are five columns, right? So this is what we call a stride. A stride is how many elements you need to jump across to get to the next value. And this applies not only on two-dimensional matrices, it applies on three-dimensional matrices, uh, tensors, and so on and so forth. Okay? Now, the more observant of you may note that the last stride is one, always one. Okay? And you might say, aha, here's an optimization strategy. You don't need n strides, you only need n minus 1 strides, and you would be wrong. To see why, we need to look at something more interesting in the go slices. You see, go slices, like I said, are genius because you don't, you don't, really, you don't really manipulate the data, you manipulate the metadata. So here is a slice, you make a byte slice of 5, and then you slice it. Uh, both a, B and C have a length of 2, right? But you don't touch the memory underneath it, right? The memory underneath it stays the same. Visually, we can represent it like this. A is this. B merely constrains the length to 2, but the cap remains the same. And C constrains the um, length of, to 2, but because, um, because it, it's, not, it's not pointing to the first element of the underlying array, the cap changes to 4. We can do this similarly with um, multidimensional slices. Again, in multidimensional slices, in a 2D array for this example, you can slice along as many dimensions as there are dimensions in your multidimensional slice. So if you want to slice only columns, like you want 1, 2, 6, 7, 11, 12, sure, you can slice along the columns, um, 1, 2, 3. Or you can slice on both columns and rows. You can just slice by rows. You get the point. So visually, we can represent it like this. Um, the green one is the stride. Um, of the columns, and the blue one's the stride of the rows. So this is A, this is B, and this is C. Now you may, you, you may note that um, they all still have a stride of one. Yes, but what happens when you do this? You want to only have columns 1, 6, 11, 3, 8, 13. So you want to slice while you skip the second column. So this is when you run into issues where you have strides that are greater than one. The question is then this, why? Why would you allow for sl uh, slicing a matrix, ma matrix with a step? Well, 
Remember what I said about a view on memory? If you merely manipulate the uh, metadata, you don't have to allocate data underneath it, and that makes things fast, right? If you don't have to reallocate a, a, a matrix every time you slice, that makes it really fast. So when you deal in, in data science, you come across this issue a lot. Um, you, you tend to have to slice with steps, and sometimes the steps can be very funny numbered steps. So that's, that's why it's, not a, it's a non-negotiable feature for, for the tensor library. <sighs> so that's, that's when you get um, strides greater than one. And to very quickly recap, here's the uh, tensor interface, what the slice can do, and what a tensor needs to have. Okay? And because the strides and shapes are so important, we encapsulate them into a data structure called AP, short for access pattern, which takes the shape and strides. So now we've got the basic building blocks of a multi-dimensional slice. Now it's maybe some time to lay down some design principles on how, how to go ahead with um, designing this. So Singaporeans, it says that they're characterized by three Ks. <laughs> so being of Asian persuasion myself, I've also been sort of brought up by these values. And for the people who don't understand what these three Ks are, Kiasu means afraid to lose, or in other words, competitive, right? To be competitive, the tensor must be fast, it must be efficient. And there is a very general rule, right, in computer science that to, make, to, 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 to be very efficient, what you do is you do as little as possible. So allocate as few times as possible. Instead of doing an add op as many times as there are elements in the slice, use vectorized operations in, in, the, um, in the operations, okay? I'm not gonna talk about the nitty gritty details of saying using k-cache grind or val grind to, to, to figure out the cache lines and stuff like that. I'm just gonna talk about the basics do as little as possible. Right, and being Kiasi means that you're risk averse. Uh, it's said that Postel's law, um, you guys familiar with that? Be liberal with what you accept, but be conservative with what you emit out. It's not only a good philosophy for TCP, it's actually also a very good philosophy for life, and having a data structure that takes generic data types actually allows you to bring that to the logical extreme. Lastly, like in any relationship, a relationship with your library is one where you have to put a lot of work to maintain. And if you have a library that you write and you don't, you don't enjoy maintaining it, what's the point, right? In fact, that's like the major, um, the major driving factor for these various attempts at making these uh, generic tensors was because it was kind of getting hard to maintain um, the library. So let's jump into it, sorry. The first attempt started very simple but grew into monstrosity. It was one interface, everything else implemented that interface. And you've already seen that interface, I've actually introduced that to you, it's this monster thing. Now Go has this thing about having small interfaces, unfortunately to fully qualify for a, for, for a, for a multi-dimensional slice all these are required um, except for the serialization bits. So for every data type I was interested in, floats, uh, if I want a tensor of float 64, if I want a tensor of float 32s, I would be uh, creating this um, structure. So that led to many sub-packages. And for the, to, to, to foreshadow a bit, the CUDA packages were a bit different. They, they took on the form of Go style ten, uh, slices in the sense that I don't store a slice, I store the pointer to a GPU memory, okay? So, like I said, this ended up creating a lot uh, of sub-packages, and it was, it was fine. I mean, that's fine. That's very idiomatic Go. The problem I had, though, was this. All of them had to import the tensor slash types package because the tensor slash types had the AP structure as well as the data type structure. And this made things um, very ugly, to be fair. Uh, so, where we were. I started with the Float64 library, so or tensor of Float64s, and then it started growing to Float32s because I needed to optimize for speed. And eventually, it became really hard to keep all my packages in sync to have the same types, to have the same whatevers. Every time I added a new method, the other, the other packages would also have the new methods. 
So I moved on to using code generation, and by the way, this is the best code generation tool I've used, but that's from my you know, experience. So with uh, go inline, you could just um, define your package, say float64, and say copy from float64, copy everything, and then you can move on. So in short, it was very idiomatic. It was no reflex, and this was actually nine months ago. I was like, I bragged about it on Reddit, saying that I, I don't need any reflect. But it was hard to maintain. Um, and, and as Gorgonia grows, it grows in, grows in uh, a pub, as a public library, I realized that it's starting to be very difficult to just give people a Go generate program says, hey, if you want your data type to fulfill this tensor, here's a Go generate for you, use it. That's a, that's a bit of a hard sell for a lot of people who, to use the library. So I decided to tidy up the packages, OK? So a clever idea struct. Why not hold, have one struct that um, manages the type, and then every, the, the underlying data structure can be a, an interface, specifically this? Very clean, very beautiful. And the array interface is simply this, right? It has a length, it has a cap, what you would expect from an array. So for every data type, you just Define this and define the arrays. Um, def define the methods for the array, which are basically sim simple sort of yeah wrappers for your normal slice slice semantics. This is all great. Problem? It was dog slow. Now I did some benchmarks, and it turns out that these two were the biggest culprits. F uh, I wanted to find out why, so I did some benchmarks, and it's two, two magnitudes um, slower. As for why, uh, Bill already mentioned it this, this morning. When you return an interface, um, since Go 1.5, the, inter the, the primitive type cannot be stuck in the interface pointer anymore, so it gets allocated on the heap. Remember what I said about not doing any work? Using a get and set method actually led to a lot more work being done. So another brilliant idea struck. OK, we can just type switch on the data type. And if, if it's something that the library knows about, use the spe uh, specialized methods, use specialized slice semantics. Right? That's a brilliant idea. And then at the same time, I was also trying to figure out how to make the CUDA um, tensors fit with the new design. So why not steal a leaf from Go's handbook? Go already gave a very nice guide to how to do this, and that's what it is. This is the current um, attempt at the dense tensor. It looks like this. Uh, yeah, it looks a bit ugly. And visually, you can go, holy shit. Why are there two pointers to, to the same array object? Well, let me tell you. I'm Detective Chimp here. So walk through, walking through the, 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 the structure, we are all familiar with the access pattern. No change here. But let's talk about d-types, OK? You will note that a slice in Go uh, slices do not actually contain the type. It's only three words. None of the three words represent its types because the compiler already knows about its type. And this is what generally is known as generics, yeah? So we don't have that advantage. So you have to store the d-type. And the only reason why you want to store the d-type uh, the, 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 the type is because you want to iterate on, you want to access the data. Originally, the D type was just an int, but uh, then, I, then it was a reflect.type, but mainly for the size method. Yeah? And I wrapped it in a D type um, type, uh, in a D type struct, because Gorgonia actually does type inference, um, Hindley, Mil Hindley Milner style type inference. So I needed some. Um, extras for it. But let's move on to the most interesting bit. These two. If you are familiar with the reflect package, there is a very interesting statement that says, this cannot be used safely or portably. So why is it there? Well, the first reason why there is a uh, slice header in the struct itself is because it turns out iteration and converting it to a slice happens a lot, right? So I don't want to keep um, reallocating slice headers to convert it into a slice, so I keep it as a permanent like uh, permanent thing there. And if ever Go needs um, if ever Go needs uh, 
because, okay, let's, let's hold it back a bit. There is the unsafe pointer as well. Uh, right, the unsafe pointer. Uh, the unsafe pointer is there to hold the reference so that it doesn't get garbage collected away. And if, if, ever, if ever Go comes up with a gener uh, compacting garbage collector, well, this then changes to, you know, having to convert an unsafe pointer to a UIN pointer before casting it into a slice. Okay? <sighs> right. Remember earlier I said that the genius of Go slices is that you only mess with the metadata. You don't mess with the data. But let's face it, a slice is very useless if you do not have access to its data. With the exception of very, very specific cases such as using CUDA tensors, you will always want access to your data. That's why we need to be able to access our data through slices, uh, slice semantics. So there is a guiding principle that I sort of came up with to, to create a hierarchy of methods in order to access your data. First, where possible, use slice semantics. That is to say, if my library already provides understandings of um, floats and blah, 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 use it. If not, we'll move on to use reflection. And lastly, we, we fall back onto the always available pointer arithmetic, which, by the way, you should not do. Uh, here is the benchmark of, of, of the um, methods. Now, the, the pointer arithmetic method, method actually allocates an extra allocation because it uses the reflect.new at um, function, which causes a lot more allocation. So it is a method that, that, that should be used as sparsely as possible. Now, to be clear, there are other forms of converting a pointer into a, a slice, but they're generally quite clunky. Let me show you two of them. So the first way is to convert um, your pointer into a, an array of type T. But the problem is the max array value changes from versions to versions. When I started about two years ago on this project, it was one shift 32 was fine, and then for a for bytes, as in your max array could only be one shift 32 bytes, and then now it's one shift 50 bytes. Um, the weird part is it's not quite logical as to, there, I don't understand why it's actually fifth, one shift 50 when the theoretical value should be one shift 30, 63. Um, then there is the other view, which is to say all data are just slices of bytes. Why don't you just store them as a slice of bytes and then convert and, and then cast them uh, to, to this? This is fine if, you're, if you, you, you are ever only going to work with slices that you know the types of. If, for example, you want to use my library and you want to define your own type that, um, takes, uh, that, that sits in, in, in this tensor, I do not know your type, so I cannot, slide, I cannot cast it into your type. right? And so there'll be, it's a lot more clunky to move things around. All these goes to say that Go is too safe. Now look. I appreciate the fact that I cannot shoot myself in the foot. That's fantastic. But sometimes you do need to take the safeties off, even if it means shooting yourself in the face. Right. Um, now that I'm nearly done, throughout this talk, I've not actually given a lot of t talk about generic stuff. But I'd like to share some opinion on generics. The first thing I'd like to share is that algorithms are harder than you think. For, um, for a quick mental exercise, implement add. Very simple. Just implement a generic add, bearing in mind that it has to return type T. Now, if you do this in Java, and you're not allowed to use the, let's say you, you have Java T extend numbers, extends number. You're not allowed to use the double value method of number, because that's not what it is does. If it's an int, you will add an int to an int, right? So what I'm trying to say is it's a lot of things to think about when you, when you, when you think about generics, right? In, in the case of add, you've got to think about other things like overflows, underflows, and especially other edge, edge cases, especially those that deal with um, data type. Speaking of data type uh, related edge cases, do this. Implement div. <laughs> it, it turns out it's, uh, it's harder than you expect because in Go, uh, when you divide by zero, and when you divide an int by zero, it panics. So you've got to check. You've got to add checks here and there, and it, your code turns out to be a lot more verbose, even if you have generics. Well, generics, the compiler will probably take care of a lot of code generation, but you know, 
that's my point. So I decided to actually look at what Haskell does. So this is a num um, type class in Haskell. And in case you don't know what a type class in Haskell is, it's basically like a statically compiled interface in Go. So a num is anything that uh, implements these methods. And speaking of type classes, I actually went ahead and tried type system coded, uh, type system guided code generation for the tensors. Uh, see, I already written a library for um, Hindley -Mil Milner type interfacing. So why not try to use implement a type system on top of that to generate code? Well, not a great idea, it turns out. <laughs> you see, it turns out that that was halfway there to creating a new programming language, and you know what? As the young people say nowadays, ain't nobody got time for that shit. So I turned back and manually re uh, went back to writ uh, manually written templates. And speaking of templates, ugh, I hate templates. I don't like templates in C++. I don't like templates. I don't like C macros, right? Because you can do really, really dumb shit, and I've done them. But as far as Go uh, templates go, I have a rule with regards to using templates to generate generic code. The rule is make it as simple as possible. You know the C++ templates are Turing complete? Well, don't make your templates Turing complete. That's a very bad idea. So with regards to gener uh, generating code using templates, I keep my templates very, very simple. Repeat as much as possible, where, where possible, and yeah, and undry, basically. Lastly, uh, this is not really related to um, not really related to the topic of generics, but it should be right. It should fit the un under the umbrella. The notion of genericity can be different, right? For most people, uh, a data structure holding a generic data uh, is, is a data structure that holds generic data type. But what about memory, right? The the best part about the design of this current tensor is that it holds. Cued up memory pointers. It holds when you need when you need to come to a point where you need to manually manage your memory for your data science or AI related stuff. Guess what? It's just a construction option away. You can actually build uh, a tensor with manually managed memory using this type of data structure. So, having said all that and done all that, there is more work to be done, right? The I think. Uh, Multi-dimensional iteration can be improved a lot better. Uh, there, there can be a lot more specialization of routines. And yeah, who knows? I'm, I'm interested in going into, into different types of code generation, maybe CCC-driven uh, code generation. Yeah. So the question is this. Ultimately, this brings up the question, will generics in Go help anything? In, in the case of... Um, high performance tensors for the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence, I don't think it works, it, it would help that much. A lot of times you will want to work on your individual um, data type as, uh, as, as it is. If, you, if you're working on an int, you want to work on an int, you don't want to, you, know, you don't want to cast it into a float and then cast it back into an int, uh, convert it into a float and convert it back into an int. You really want to stay within the data type. So short of Go actually implementing like Haskell style parametric uh, poly polymorphism or even C++ concepts, right? I don't think generics would actually help solve much of this. Unsafe stuff would, more unsafe stuff would, but that, I, I can understand why that's a bad idea with a capital B and D, uh, capital B and I. Right, in closing, I've got an ask. Gorgonia is a library. Um, the tensor library is a slash tensor. It's, it's basically a library for you to build machine learning platforms, right? It's a young library, and in, as they say, all, many eyes make bugs shallow, so I want to find bugs. There are a lot of bugs, I'm very sure of it. I'm not the best programmer in the world. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> nope, cool. Any questions? Yay, I rushed through everything. Thank you, Jenny. No problems. Okay,